Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to Making Sense of Digital Banking. I'm Helene Panzerino and I'm the Director of the Digital Finance Portfolio at Imperial College Business School. And I'm joined today, I'm very happy to say, by Jason Maud, who's the Chief Technology Advocate at Starling Bank. Jason, uh, would you like morning. to tell people a bit more about yourself? Sure. So um, I am, uh, as uh, you said, the Chief Technology Advocate at Starling Bank, which means my job is to go around and talk about the technology behind Starling Bank. Uh, the reason we need someone to do that is because in order to work as a bank, we need trust. We need the trust of our customers, of the industry and of regulators. And um, in order to trust Starling Bank, because we are entirely digital and very technologically focused, you need to trust the technology behind the bank. So my job is to go around and increase that trust. Um, I come from an engineering background, so I studied engineering at university and was a software engineer for many years, pure software engineer before moving into technology advocacy. Thank you very much. I can assure everyone that I was not a software engineer but uh, I have been working alongside predominantly tier one uh, financial institutions alongside the fintechs to create co genuine commercial engagement for them for a large majority of my career. I did, however, start my career in commercial banking many long, many years ago on the correspondent banking side. So I have seen the journey from traditional banking, incumbent banking through to working with the fintechs, forwarding on to how genuine partnership and collaboration and potentially disruption is affecting our market. And today we're going to go on this journey of how we arrived at digital banking, what do we mean by digital banking, who are the players, we'll have a look at Starling Bank obviously in much more detail, how the story started, where it is right now, where it might be in the future. Not forgetting though that we will see what the incumbents are doing to combat the onslaught of the digital bank because it's not that some, some are actually coming to the fore, not everyone is just sitting back and seeing, you know, letting it happen around them. And then we're going to look at what the priorities are before we wrap up with questions from yourself. So we're holding questions to the end, although we are going to start and finish with a poll question. So let me go to the poll as well. So the poll is in progress and the poll essentially is asking you, given what's happening right now with the crisis, many more people are downloading their mobile apps, something on the order of 10 to 12 million, I think, during the last few weeks have downloaded their mobile apps. So the question is, is this an opportunity or do you think that incumbents will actually come back and win out with this? Or will this just temporary blip in the market because we're in a current crisis situation and digital will prevail? So I'm going to let you take some time. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I'm watching the poll response come in. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Whoops. We're, we're going a little bit back and forth. Thank you to so many of you for joining us as well. We're all adjusting to the new virtual learning and I'm pleased to say that it's going very well. I think actually three quarters of our learning is now being delivered virtually. Okay, I think I can close the poll now. More or less, we are split 60-40. Mm. Or 65-35, yeah. Yeah, 67 It's actually moving now more in the direction of 70-30. <laughs> yeah, so the incumbents, you all seem to think that the incumbents are going to win out, and this may revert back to the pro the question that around trust, Jason, that you mentioned in the mm -hmm. very beginning of this as well, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to close that poll and go back. Okay. So you all think that this might be a moment for the incumbents to actually step up and capture some of the market. So before we get into talking about this, I really would like to discuss and delve a little bit deeper into the evolution of the digital bank. What is digital? What do we mean by digital? How are the business models different in digital to incumbent banking? What is your opinion? Is digital 99% built or 1% built? What is the difference between multi-channel, omni-channel and digital banking? What makes a bank digital? What are the implications from a regulatory point of view? Do we actually need digital banking? 
if we're all multi-banking and over 50% of the UK population is multi-banking with an incumbent and some digitals, and we've all during the last few weeks actually downloaded and used our app, do we still need a digital bank? Against the backdrop of digital banking in the UK, we can see that we have a shrinking market in terms of banks. So in 1960, we had probably around 150 banks. And by 2010, we were down to maybe four or five main banks who had over 70% of the market share. Clearly not competitive. And with the open banking, which was launched in 2018, was partly a response to the lack of competitiveness that we saw in the, the banking landscape. Few does not engender genuine competition, which is never good for the end user, i.e. the customer. At the same time, we could see that the number of bank branches was shrinking in the, in the UK, and this continues to happen. And this is not just a UK phenomenon, this is a global phenomenon. Now, Jason will talk about the fact that with Starling Bank, you don't have any branches. The theory is that we don't need to go to a branch, right? We can do everything mobile. Hmm. Would you like to comment? Yes. Um, so the question of, you know, what, what many, many people, not just um, the digital banks, but many people in the banking sector as a whole are starting to ask, ask the question or have been asking the question for some time. What's the point of bank branches? Why do we have them? What, what are they there for? Um, so it used to be that you had a bank branch because you originally, originally, way back when, because you could go in and meet with your bank branch manager or, you know, account manager or person who was responsible for your finances and would, you know, help you access your finances and, you know, give you loans and mortgages if necessary and knew you. Now, obviously that changed and we gradually moved away from that um, to the point where a lot of what was known about a customer was not held by the bank branch or the individual bank manager, but was held at the um, at the you know central level in computer systems, um, and you know all of the information was in there. And the bank branch was simply the place where people had access to those computer systems. Mm. Now the question is, well, if if the bank has you know if if the all of the information is on computer anyway in a some centralized system why do we need a bank branch to be able to interpret that for you why can't we just give you access to your banking data over the internet once the internet came along that started to be a question i was just um, going to say so it wasn't until the 1980s right and tim berners lee and when we had the internet sure. well the right? 1990s and, uh, in fact you know when it, by the time it became you know, widely used. Which was really what we would call phone banking or online banking, starting in yeah. uh, in Palo Alto and then moving into France before we came to First Direct in the UK, which was, I think, mm. one of our, our first and still one of the one of the most top rated yeah, online absolutely. or phone stroke online banking platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so it there was definitely an evolution there. But what what ended up happening is that the incumbent banks were then stuck in this weird hybrid model, right? They had mm. some online stuff, but that was really a sort of like, where well, whatever, you know, that's a secondary thing. You know, it, like people went, well, it's the internet. We have to do the internet because the internet, <laughs> yeah, you know, that was that was their justification for doing it, right? So they pushed some stuff online. They, they a lot of the time saw it as just a cost saving measure. Yeah. You know, oh, if we put something online, people won't need to phone us up or come into a branch. Great, that saves on costs, tick. Yeah, yeah, but they didn't really. They, so they paid lip service to online, but they didn't really use it. I, I would so, actually on, on that point, and I agree with you. I think in the very beginning, also there was a fear that margins on products would be um, cut if everything mm. was happening online. Also, there were fewer opportunities for cross-selling, particularly yeah. at, a, at a, uh, a retail level. And if you knew your customers, you could cross-sell products. If everything was happening online, and the human was taken out of that. So you you do, you're using email as a communication tool. You have the yep. cost savings from having certain things online, but you're yep. missing out on what was a margin driven. I think traditionally incumbent banks, we could all agree, it was yep. a margin driven, product driven, inside out approach mm. versus a digital customer driven, outside in approach. And it's not on cost, it's on customer service and further engagement. Yeah. Um, 
the uh, idea that cross-selling couldn't be done online will be a surprise to um, executives at Amazon. Um, who <laughs> have made a giant, uh, you know, juggernaut titan of the tech industry by doing exactly that, uh, cross-selling online and um, opening up, you know, uh, marketplaces and so on, and, and essentially selling other people's products. They've even made money out of that, uh, which is um, fascinating. So what happened with Starling Bank is that we came along and we really said, okay, we are going to embrace this digital banking thing, not as just a side show, uh, but as a main concern, as our primary channel for delivery is this, you know, is um, a, an online delivery system. Hmm. Um, so we uh, have thought about digital banking from the get go, because that's the only way we can do things. So we are forced to work out how we can deliver everything online. And uh, necessity is the mother of invention, as it is often said. Um, so I think what distinguishes a, say, digital bank from um, mm. a, another bank is, are you digital first? Is your digital your primary channel of delivery? Uh, or is it just a secondary thing that you tacked on? Uh, this is this is a point and a couple of things that have come out of what you just said. I want to talk about business models, but I also want to fast forward a little bit to what is a challenger bank or what is a digital bank. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. I think this is this is the other thing. There's a little bit of confusion and misconception in the market. We talked about challenger banks. We talked about neo banks. There's a little bit of interchange of, of terms. And I, and I want to be clear that also in, in 2007, 2008, when we were in the financial crisis, we also saw the launch of the smartphone, which is the thing mostly that enabled a digital bank, a purely digital bank. I think you might agree with that, Jason. Mm -hmm. But challenger banks come in all different kinds of flavors. You know, if we look at the mid-size full-service bank, i.e. Metro, for example, which got the first license in 2010 after, what, 150 years or something in the UK, that's seen as a challenger bank. Then you have specialist banks that do one thing like asset finance or mortgage finance. They're seen as a challenger bank, but they may be a full service bank as well. Then you have the non-bank brands like Tesco Bank, for example, where it's all about the data and all about the loyalty, but really less about the banking, right? Which is why they get taken over or uh, acquired by other, other financial players in the field. And then finally, we come back to the digital only bank, which for me, started with the fact that it was in the palm of my hand or in the pocket of my trousers and that was the thing that I was going to be interacting with digitally without the cost infrastructure of a branch network and lots of people although I know you have more and more people we'll talk about that you know you don't have 300,000 employees distributed globally the bank that I first started working with was the third largest bank in the world our cost structure was was crazy and our tech was incredibly siloed and I think this is the other thing that I would love to explore with you is micro versus monolith. And mm -hmm. going back to your reference to Amazon, who, by the way, Amazon Prime people say they might bank with them if they bank, if they create a bank. Amazon and its marketplace model. And I'd like you to share the business model and the marketplace model with us today that Starling Bank has. Sure. So how we um, how we make money. Uh, why, how we are a viable business or attempting to become a, you know, attempting to become a profitable business. We are not yet profitable, uh, but we um, certainly before COVID came along, we hoped to mm. be profitable um, by the end of the year. Uh, now, COVID is throwing up challenges and opportunities. So what happens now is anyone's guess. Um, but anyway, how, how do we make money? So. How Starling makes money, um, you might expect to be exotic and exciting, but actually it's fairly boring. Um, it's a fairly boring uh, standard way that a bank makes money. So we uh, take deposits from customers, we uh, invest those deposits in Bank of England gilts, and we make some money off that. We lend that money out, or as much money of that as we are allowed to lend out by- Which is a relatively new thing, isn't it, for Starling Bank? It hasn't been that long that you've been lending. Um, we've always been lending in the sense of overdrafts. overdrafts. So that, that has been there since the beginning. But in terms of actually um, uh, personal loans and business loans, those are newer features. Um, and indeed, uh, we are uh, uh, a member of the 
the government sibyls and bibbles schemes, uh, which are the, you know, the, the um, government backed loans uh, that are designed to deal with coronavirus and the effects mm. that it's having on the economy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's a relatively new thing, but we do lend money out and uh, we make uh, interest from that. Uh, we also make uh, money from uh, MasterCard interchange fees. So whenever you go and use your card at a, um, at a shop, a tiny fraction of that money comes to us. And uh, then uh, the other main way we make, uh, so another way we make money is by our marketplace partners. So we have a marketplace where we integrate your Starling bank account, if you wish, with a, um, a variety of different providers of things like insurance and mortgages, pensions and so on. Uh, those uh, we will make money off. Uh, we do have started uh, very, very recently selling some premium products, particularly for our business customers. Um, so we can make money off that. And um, finally, we sell our connection to the, or hire out, I should say, our connection to the faster payment network and other uh, uh, payment networks to businesses, corporates who want to, uh, you know, uh, make bulk payments. Uh, so that's another way we do it. Now, all of this, you might be thinking, well, the margins on that must be incredibly small, and you are correct. The margins on any individual one transaction is measured in fractions of pennies. Mm. Um, so we are going for uh, a large volume of very small transactions. That's how we mm. make money. Now, you know, you must. The other thing you might be saying is, well, banks can't make money off that. That's you know, that's impossible. Everyone knows banks can't make money off that. The reason banks, other banks, incumbent banks can't make money off that is because they have a huge cost base. And the other thing that gives us uh, an, a shot at profitability with this model is that mm. we our cost base is rem is dramatically lower uh, than it is at other banks. Uh, if you look at reports about how many. Um, uh, how many uh, customers each employee at Starling Bank supports, it is dramatically lower than um, than what other banks are supporting. Uh, other banks need many more employees to support one bank account than uh, than we do. Uh, orders of magnitude, or, or an order of magnitude at least, um, difference. So, um, the uh, so the the difference here is that we are basically running an incredibly tight margin operation where we have very low costs to support small margins and if we get large volumes then great those that will make us money uh, and that is how we are how we operate so um and one of the great things about that just as a final thought one of the great things about that model is it encourages us to try and make the bank as good as possible not to upsell products, not to you know sell more and more different things, but to try and just make great products and a great bank, um, uh, because that will get us more customers, and more customers gets us more volume, and more volume gets us uh, more money. So we are encouraged by our our uh, the way we do business to to give a great deal to the customers, which is one one of the things I I like about working at Starling Bank. It's really interesting to see the difference between servicing, you know, hundreds of people servicing uh, a smaller number of customers and, and smaller number of people servicing thousands and thousands of customers. Mm -hmm. And and to do that, and thank you for walking us through how you make money. And, and I, I think it's not lost on everyone that the B2B propositions are also a good portion, especially early on, of what the revenue stream was versus gathering the momentum, creating the community of yep. the B2C proposition. And this sort of leads me a little bit to the funding uh i the funding journey of starling because mm -hmm. every digital bank some more than others right will have to to raise significant amounts of money and starling bank less than others in my in my uh observation mm -hmm. in order to a leave some money uh on reserve because you are a bank and i think it's important yep. also to distinguish the fact that a bank a bank is a bank with a banking license right correct it, it's <laughs> There are other wannabes out there and the FCA and the PRA are coming down on people for misleading advertising who maybe just connect my accounting package to my bank account and mm -hmm. offer me other services. That's not mm -hmm. a bank if there's a different bank behind them. And I think we have to be very clear about that for the consumer and the end user. Absolutely. So basically, right? 
and becoming a bank, even when you go to the to the Prudential Regulation Authority, even if you have an interim license where you're still able to continue raising money, which I think was part of Starling Bank's journey, yep. while you're waiting the 18 months or so for a license, you still have to raise a significant amount of money to leave money on uh, reserve, but also to market, right? And I know I know marketing and digital banking is a dirty word because people say they don't do any marketing. But to create that community, to gather that community, mm -hmm. to be able to service it, I, the journey of Starling Bank from individuals to businesses is also, I think, quite interesting if you want to share that. The journey from us doing individual banking to business banking? Yeah, because it went, I, I, the individual to the joint, to the, to the business, mm -hmm. right? What, what my observation is, is that you never went out there, and particularly Ann Bowden, who's the CEO of Starling Bank, never went out there to say, yeah, we're going to be profitable in the next five minutes, and you know, it's all going to happen quickly, and you're not going to even know that it, you're going to blink and you miss it. I think mm -hmm. she was always very uh, measured about the fact that it, it was a bit of a journey, right? Mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So it's um, one of the key things about building a bank and building banking trust is that you've got to say we're in it for the long term, right? We're not just going to be a sort of here today, gone tomorrow, uh, quick, get rich, quick scheme. That that You can't build a bank like that. Um, as you say, banks are very different. Building a bank as a startup is very different from anything else because you need large amounts of money behind it. Um, not to provide runway, but simply to provide the, you know, the capital that you are in forced to have uh, by uh, the terms of the regulators, um, you know, who don't want to see a sort of like, because basically giving you a banking license, the government is saying, if everything goes wrong and the bank collapses, we will bail you out or, or at least bail your customers out, if not you. Um, and in order to do that, the government needs to have a reasonable degree of trust that you're not just going to go, oh, okay, we're going to take the money and run or do something ridiculously risky or incompetent. So give it, getting a banking license is a huge thing. And the PRA looks very sternly at all applications and goes, you know, are you really a trustworthy organization who we can, you know, give this guarantee to? And, and am I right in thinking that the percentage that you need to leave uh, on reserve is the same percentage applies the same percentage uh, applies to incumbents tier one large incumbents as yeah. it does to the yeah yes yeah as far as I know there's no difference you know there's right. there's no difference in what we have to do in terms of you know what we're allowed to the percentage we're allowed to lend out of deposits and so on that you know uh, any other bank is allowed to lend out which so, in the beginning would have been very, much more onerous when you didn't have sure, a lot of deposits absolutely right? yeah indeed and this is this is the thing the um the uh, the you know th that's the other drive not only to get customers but also to get customers who will, are willing to put their deposits with us that's mm. that's another thing because mm. one you know mentioning trust what you said we're seeing a lot of you know a lot of um uh individuals consumers were willing to trust us with their data you know they were very willing to trust us with you know uh their spending data so they put a thousand or two thousand or whatever pounds in every so often and spend it, you know, that was fine. They were okay with that, but they weren't willing to put their salary in, mm. you know, or use us as their main bank. That is starting mm. to change. And in fact, Starling Bank is doing, um, uh, I, you know, I heard um, from some of our analysts is doing better in terms of getting um, the, the deposits in basically that compared to other, um uh digital banks not compared to the incumbents we're still behind them on you know deposit levels average deposit levels of our customers but we are doing well and i think that speaks to our marketing strategy of saying no we are a bank we're not just a one word you know um tech company like a facebook or an amazon who you're not really sure is a bank we actually have bank in the name so, you know, that's another trust thing. You know, you can trust us with your money. Moving and she from... just mentioned it. I realized that a lot of the others are oh, just one word. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Whereas we are Starling Bank. You know, none of the others aren't, you know, Monzo Bank or Revolut Bank. They are. Or Coconut you know, Bank. <laughs> yeah, or indeed, or Atom Bank. You know, yeah. Um, uh, what we have done in terms of moving from consumer banking to business banking, we did that as a result of going, oh, there's a, you know, 
it, like a lot of innovation at Starling, what happened is we built the tech and we built the tech in such a way that it was fairly malleable, fairly changeable. It was easy, you know, it was resilient enough to change. A lot of the time, the, the reason tech doesn't change at um, uh, other older incumbent banks is not because it's not changeable it's because it's not resilient so they they fear that if they come along and you know press a button somewhere to change something the whole thing will come crashing down around their ears whereas we built the tech from the get-go with the idea that not you know if something goes wrong what would we do we built it with the idea in mind of this will go wrong inevitably inevitably this technology will go wrong because all technology goes wrong so we're not going to sugarcoat it we're not going to pretend that we're better than other people we know this tech will go wrong so what happens when it does go wrong? How does how do we recover? And how does the tech recover itself? Because that's the best way. If the tech can recognize, oh, something's gone wrong, I must recover. You know, that's the best way of doing it. And because we did that, we were able to make loads of changes with with you know a reasonable degree of confidence that our tech would just go, oh, something went wrong there. I'll try making that payment again. Um, and can I ask you, do you think in, in relation to what happened with the TSB and and, and for the uh, mm -hmm. audience who, who are yeah. not aware of it uh, the TSB which which hived off from I think Lloyds Bank previously yeah. um, with Banco Sabadell they were they were they were part of the Banco Sabadell group I think they made an investment mm -hmm. in and they were trying to migrate the technology from the yeah. TSB technology to the Banco Sabadell um, technology sure. resulting yeah. in uh, a catastrophe which went mm -hmm. on for months if you want mm -hmm. to just tell, talk a little bit about that yeah so this is a, this is a right this is a funny <laughs> funny story unless of course you work at TSP in which case it's not or you're um, a customer TSP. <laughs> or you're a customer or indeed you are one of the regulator who will not find this amusing no. um so what happened is that um TSP was part of Lloyds Bank um and then um during the financial crisis uh HBOS another bank got into a lot of trouble and Lloyds came along and bought it and the regulator looked at uh, Lloyd's TSB Halifax Bank of Scotland, as it now was, and said, this is slightly too large for our liking. Um, you're going to have to split up. Mm -hmm. So they split TSB off into its own separate world. Now, splitting uh, a bank uh, is a bit of a nightmare. Um, and one of the nightmares is for the technology people, because you could, you know, the, the regulator might just come along and say you are split and, you know, a magic legal wand is waved and the, now you have two separate entities. But all your data and, you know, your customer data and what's going on is stored on one system. Um, so you have to split that system up. Um, so TSB said, right, well, we'll create a new uh, system with the Bank of Salvador and so on. And so they started creating and migrating over to this new system. And Lloyd's um, said, well, you're using our system, so we're going to have to charge you. So they signed this contract and um, Lloyd's had better lawyers and uh, TSB got charged through the nose for this. And so there was this desire from TSB going this, this, you know, hiring out Lloyd system and keeping our data on it is costing us so much money. Quick, we have to move over. We have to move over. So there was this rush to develop this new system. and. Um, just before the uh, the launch, one of the executives, I forget whether it's from Bank of Salvador or TSB, boasted, hey, um, we are going to be launching uh, two and a half thousand man years worth of work tomorrow. Um, mm. Now, if I had heard that as an engineer and I was working on that project, I would have booked the next flight to Cuba um, and <laughs> have been out for the launch, uh, if not over to a different company. Um, the prospect of launching two and a half thousand man years worth of work at once is to me a nightmare. I do not know how any risk department would sign it off. Uh, I would have been having you know, a heart attack with, if that, that would be you know, happening. It was just totally, totally um, uh, like irresponsible amount of code to try and big bang release at once. Uh, but they did and everything went wrong. Um, inevitably, you know, inevitably things would have gone wrong with that. Uh, because if you're releasing that much code at once, 
not only can you not know everything that you're releasing, you can't possibly know, there's also interactions between all the different pieces of code. And you've no idea if two things that you have tested individually work fine on their own, but together they don't work. And if you're releasing that much code, the potential number of cross connections and cross bugs is huge. And inevitably things went wrong. My favorite story yeah. is that um, during this period, um, the new code um, confused, um, when, whenever, whenever you switch banks, as lots of people were doing out of TSB at that time, uh, you have to cancel all your direct debits or you have to tell backs you're canceling your direct debits. And the way you do that is by sending a backs message with a code three. Code three means this, this um, direct debit mandate is canceled because the user has switched banks. TSB confused code three with code two. Code two means this mandate has been cancelled because the uh, owner of the mandate is dead. Uh, oh. So what happened is loads of people switched bank accounts and then received letters of condolence from their energy suppliers who automatically sent them out saying, we're sorry that you have died. Of course, we will not charge you for your last bill. Very sorry. Condolences to the family and so on. And people were reading these letters going, why have I died? Why, do, why does my energy supplier think I'm dead? And no. it's because the bank confused code three and code two. Uh, oh, so, real world, a real world representation of what happens behind the tech scenes. And actually, people were not able to access their accounts for months, weren't they? Absolutely. Were yeah. <laughs> people were, there, were, there were so many problems. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. it got to the stage where, you know, uh, uh, apparently the regulator basically just set up an office in TSB's offices. Uh, you know, that's that's hearsay. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure if it's true, but it, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, they were taking a very dim view of this technology change. And I think that the, what's important here, and I think the point to emphasize is that the incumbent banks take a very different view of technology risk to the digital banks. Incumbent banks view technology, the risk of technology, uh, the inherent risk is in changing technology. So they try and wrap technology change in procedure to make sure that things don't go wrong. And they, you know, have a, a list of procedures as to, you know, oh, let's make sure that this technology change doesn't go wrong. Here's the checklist of things that could go wrong. Let's check them all off. Now, what that means is that any time something does go wrong, when they have the post-mortem, what happens is that everyone sits around and goes, well, what went wrong? And no one can be blamed. No individual can be blamed because they followed the procedure. You know, we followed all the points of the procedure and we've got a record to say that we followed them all. So you can't blame us. You know, it's like mm. uh, it's an arse covering mm. exercise. Mm -hmm. They can just hold up this piece of paper and say, well, we can't blame us. Um, and so in the end, the only thing that can be blamed is the procedure. So what happens? Well, people say, well, the procedure is at fault. We need to change the procedure to take account of this new problem that we've encountered. Let's write another few boxes on the procedure. So the procedure gets longer. And every time this happens, the procedure gets longer and longer and longer and bigger and bigger. And you've got this huge, giant stack of paper going through all of these procedures about oh, all of these things could change. You know, all of these things could go wrong. Please check them all. And no one remembers after you know a couple of years why such and such a line is in the procedure everyone's forgotten but it's in the procedure document and the procedure document must be followed it becomes a bible it becomes like holy dogma that you cannot avoid this procedure document Jason, I'm going to, I'm going to, when we go on to do a reg tech uh, course, I'm going to have you back because I think you've just opened up the whole of the reg tech conversation as well on the incumbent. Yeah. I, I'd like to to skip ahead a little bit if we can and just talk. Sure. You've, you've, you've got me thinking about what are the incumbents doing? So, so, I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to create a picture of all doom and gloom and it's not like, you know, there, there isn't uh, other things happening in the market. We are talking about digital banks and how digital banks evolved and, and of course, post 2007 and eight, when we understood platforms and algorithms and we mm. then discovered marketplaces, we had this evolution uh, of di digital banking alongside that smartphone and the demands from a customer, because a lot of this is millennial customer driven because everything happens on the phone. And then you see the knock on with the PRA where they're saying, okay, we've got this interim license and we get an onslaught of, of banking licenses in with the PRA, which there are now as well, specifically around SME banking, small business banking, which I wanna come back to when we talk about open banking. But 
it's it, there has to be something that the uh, incumbents are doing to adapt and survive and this is a piece of COBOL code I believe I'm accurate in saying that that runs on an IBM computer yeah in, in the, yeah, yeah in, in the 80s and the 90s I hired tens of thousands of COBOL programmers I apologize to the whole world because that's what <laughs> that's what all of our fault. systems is my fault that's what all of our systems are running on and and in a serious note that's what all of the uh, for example in the US that's what all the uh, corona the covid welfare systems and uh, state systems are running on mm -hmm. siloed non communicative between each other cobol systems with very few people alive literally and working mm -hmm. who can program in cobol a language mm -hmm. developed in 1969 um and, and I love the old, very sexist, she's in the back on the bottom of the picture there, the woman is in the back doing something administrative while the men are talking seriously. But also there's a picture of the cloud. And yep. I'll talk a little bit about cloud technology because you are totally in the cloud with Starling Bank. Yep. And the cloud in an incumbent conversation two or three years ago was definitely a no-no. Mm -hmm. And I see now more and more of the incumbents saying yes to the cloud. Why is mm -hmm. the cloud important? So the cloud is important because it um, allows you to uh, scale your banking systems in a reasonable manner. So before the cloud, um, you had, so for, for those who aren't aware, let's just explain what the cloud is mm -hmm. uh, in practice. The cloud is basically uh, computer server time that you can rent. So you're basically, when you say things are on the cloud, what you mean is that uh, someone has, has hired out some server time uh, on a server somewhere from a group of, uh, uh, from a, you know, an organization like Amazon or Google or Microsoft, usually. Um, now, uh, the, the server, all they've hired is the server time. They haven't hired the server. They don't know where the server is, what's, you know, uh, what else is running on the server, how the server is maintained. They have just got, you know, a reasonable guarantee that this server will be safe and secure. And, um, you know, uh, they, they uh, Amazon have this, what's called this dual security model, that they, they provide the security of the cloud and you provide the security in the cloud. So and, they, and the regulator is happy with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the regulator is happy with that. I mean, Starling Bank is a regulated entity and, you know, with the exception of a very few things which still cannot be on the cloud, mainly to do with um, card, uh, the transmission of card numbers and pins and so on, which is still requires fiscal infrastructure. Um, we are entirely within the cloud. Um, so uh, the, so the, the, the cloud allows you to basically come along and say things like, well, I'd like to try doing this. I think we should try doing business banking. Now, if you weren't in the cloud, what you would have to say is, I want to try doing business banking. Therefore, I'm going to have to invest mm -hmm. tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of pounds in servers. I'm going to have to buy physical servers, have them shipped over to my uh, office, have a special room built with special fire safety equipment to make sure that we can, you know, uh, put out any fires in the server room and protect them and so on. And we're going to have to put a load of security around so that no one can just walk in and plug something in like uh, they're in Ocean's Eleven. Um, you know, we're going to have to do all of this sort of stuff to make sure that, um, uh, you, you know, it's safe, secure and so on and in our building. And we're going to have to hire a load of people to maintain these servers on an ongoing basis. Um, my dad told me a, a story once of um, uh, he was uh, in a, uh, a um, working in a firm that had a big server room and uh, the servers were only on during the weekday. So they were only cooled during the, uh, the they were no, they were so they, the cooling during the weekdays was manually done, but it was automatically done during the weekends. Um, and that worked fine up until bank holiday Monday because uh, no one had thought to put bank holidays in and they came in on Tuesday and found that some of the servers had melted uh, oh my gosh. You know, or their insides had melted um, <laughs> and there was solder everywhere and, you know, the whole thing was fried and useless. Uh, so, I, I think it's, it's still true to say there are rooms full of shaking oh, yeah. machines that are yeah, yeah, yeah. at the edges. There right? are yeah. rooms full of big machines that look not unlike the one that the, the, the <laughs> woman is working on there. I would actually say, actually, if that picture was taken in the 70s, the woman is probably the technical one. Yeah. Uh, 
because back in the 70s, we, we, we often think now that um, uh, software engineering and sort of programming of computers is biased towards men, but that only started in the 80s. So before then, it was it was more of a uh, you know it was uh, actually there was more of a balance. Um, so uh, it's probably We're trying to get men, women into into tech, right? Yeah, the the woman is probably sitting by the computer because she's the one who knows how it works in that picture. Um, presuming that's the seventies, it might be the eighties actually, given the haircuts. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there are still rooms full of servers running COBOL, uh, which you know the no one knows how to maintain anymore. Uh, but the brilliant, the brilliant thing about the cloud is that you can come along and rather than having to buy the server with, uh, for an enterprise that you don't know whether it will work or not, you can just say, OK, we'll hire some server time. And then if the server time, if the you know product takes off, great, we'll hire more server time and expand, you know, and upgrade to a bigger size of database uh, or what have you. Or uh, we'll just ditch it and you pay for what you use rather than being you know, left with a giant server that you bought that is now useless. Jason, can I, I want to I want to carry on with this this conversation of of uh, the cloud and the marketplace. And as I said to you, we're talking about incumbents and what they can do, what you're doing, and some of the questions that are coming in from people um, who are listening with us uh, are around the open banking side of things. And I want to mm -hmm. talk about open banking. Open banking, which uh, in the UK on a very wet Saturday afternoon had a very quiet launch in January mm -hmm. 2018. Um, not meant to be a revolution, meant to be an evolution mm -hmm. brought up about because the competitions and market authority saw what was happening as we saw in our previous slides. Too few banks servicing too many people, mm -hmm. not enough competition. Banks were not self-regulating to change that. Mm -hmm. and so they mandated that they would have to share the data with permission yep. from, from the customer, of course. So yep. that we have this two-way traffic and you know if i buy something on amazon on that marketplace i can pay amazon directly without having to go through paying mastercard in the middle or go through my bank and do something else but affect the direct translation right sure yeah so this always comes up in the question of you're built on the marketplace you're in the cloud you work through the apis the application programming interfaces which is the new technology that we're all communicating with non-standardized i might add but what do you think the that you are born with it it's native to you what do you think the uh, incumbents will do about this are they happy to get with the apis you know very frequently i hear people like shafali roy from true layer slamming them because they're not picking up quick enough mm -hmm. it, are they in, in danger of becoming dumb pipes or is the the mandate and the will of the people i.e the the customer going to force everyone to get on with api marketplace customer relationships um i think it will so i think the will of the people will come in um and force force the uh the the implementation of apis for the public apis for the easy easy and secure simultaneously easy and secure transfer of data um when a killer application of uh open banking or data transference gets produced so I think the problem at the moment is that banks are um, that that no one that we've got this ability to transfer data from place to place to place, and for for a customer to come in and say, "I would like my financial data, please," and I would like to take it and move it over here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, we haven't found anything where everyone goes, "Well, obviously you do that. Why, you know, why would you do anything differently?" And that obviously requires data transference, so you have to get with the program. And I think once someone finds that and implements it and, you know, does that successfully, then suddenly it will become man mandatory, you know, mandated by the customers. Basically, the customers will go, well, if you don't have easy data transference, I, why would I bank with you? You know, why? Why would I bank with you when you it's it'll become like a bank that says, oh, put your money in this bank and then you can't take it out again. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was just customers say, would go, why yeah. would I bank with you if that's the case? I, right, you know, it will become the same thing somewhere. with data. You know, they'll, they'll be going, well, why would I bank with a bank that doesn't allow me to transfer data? But in order to do that, you need something to come along that will allow for that. Now, at the moment, we've got things like account aggregators, which mm -hmm. are fine, but like a few people use them, but it's not like everyone's clamoring and saying, oh God, we need account aggregators now, you know. So the things that I can think of are 
the the thing that I thought of of you know how this would happen is basically things to do with flow efficiency for the customer. So things to do with you know so the the one I keep coming back to is buying a house. So at the moment with buying a house, the customer basically becomes the project manager for a project. They have to go in and they have to go into an estate agent, negotiate with them to try and get a house. They then have to go and get a load of, you know, conveyancing and so on done. They then have to go to a bank to get a mortgage. They then have to go to some solicitors to get, you know, some legal stuff done. And they're sitting there going, well, why, why on earth am I having to negotiate with these three different parties and coordinate communication mm. between them? It's ludicrous. You know, I want to just buy a house. I don't want to have to manage a, you know, freaking projects and negotiate between different vendors and that you know when so like and i think one of the key things that is blocking you know all those things being joined up under one roof and having just a you know the house shop that you can walk into and buy a house is data transference mm -hmm. you know you need to be able to transfer the data to you know and part of that is the banking data to show that the customer can afford the house that they want to buy Mm -hmm. And I think that when someone invents the house shop where you can go in and buy a house or a flat without having to go through this nightmare rigmarole of having to deal with 50 different people, then then that will suddenly rely on data transference. And you'll suddenly go, oh, OK, right. Well, we need, you know, my bank doesn't support that, so I can't use the house shop. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to go through this rubbish old way of doing things. Fine, I'm going to switch banks. I think if any one of the hundred or so people who are listening to us sets up the house shop, they should credit you, Jason. But but <laughs> and I and I and there I there you go. There's, there's your billion dollar idea right there. Yeah. Right. You've got you heard it here first. And I appreciate that the, the part of technology, and particularly in fintech, I mean, it is meant to be the technology of the day that answers the financial needs of the people that need to you know the consumer that needs to use it. If it doesn't start to make life simpler and in real time embedded in my life, then we haven't achieved our aim or what fintech set out to do. I, I want to um, also, I'm conscious of, of time and, and answering questions as well, but I want to also touch on someone from uh, Brazil has given us a really good overview of, of the, um, the 80s and the 90s and inflation and how it uh, affected the uh, incumbent giants. And towards the end of the question, uh, it's around having uh, some comments on how to accelerate competition from the regulator and consumer perspective mm -hmm. in the post pandemic scenario. And I also would like to bring in here, uh, I think it's important to highlight that I mean, we see it in here, we see it in the, in the US and, the, and I'm sure we, people see it around the world to get the money out the door for the pandemic rescue packages. Yep. FinTechs or digital solutions, in mm -hmm. my opinion, particularly around SMEs have really come on into their own. If, mm -hmm. if people, if, the, if small businesses didn't understand open banking features and benefits and how it worked for them before, mm -hmm. they definitely understand now. So maybe in connection to this question, do you think that a, a silver lining from this a horrific crisis mm -hmm. is that there will be more competition and the regulator and the consumer perspectives will be considered in the solutions that come forward post pandemic? Um, hmm. Possibly. I so I'm not sure that the pandemic is going to do much to accelerate competition necessarily, um, because uh, it's in order to the main thing that's going to accelerate competition is mass transference of accounts. Um, so uh, the, at the moment you had you know you had your slide before of the consolidated bank accounts and you came down consolidation of banks and building societies which came down to six now mm -hmm. what needs to happen ultimately is those six need to divest themselves you know the, like customers need to get out of those six and move into other banks right and the government can do so much the government's done things like uh, you know paying people to leave the six and come over to a new bank but until people actually decide you know what we need to come over here and join this bank they won't be able you know that there, there, there won't be the competition that's necessary now you're right with businesses small businesses are in a very weird place right now and they are finding that banking entirely online without the need to go into branch and particularly with a group of people who understand their needs are trying to help them automate and are trying to provide them, you know, as quickly as possible with the support they need, such as Starling. Uh, that is 
proving much uh that is that is proving a big jump you know a big movement of um uh business bank accounts um and um we're also seeing you know a, i think um uh, monzo overtook nationwide recently as the uh, the uh, the the having the uh, current account switching crown um, I think we can mention here for people who are not UK residents, switching in the UK, people are more likely to get divorced than they are to switch their banks. Yeah. And I, I believe in, in last year, it went from 2% per annum up to 7%, which you were leading the way uh, mm. in. And now also yeah. we're seeing that Monzo is getting the switch as well. And yeah, I think there's, there's a little bit of Stockholm syndrome with your, with your incumbent bank. Uh, yeah. And a little, a little bit of, of going back to what you mentioned before, trust. Because trust, yeah. what happened in the financial crisis, people still do trust. Yeah, that absolutely. You, and, and despite the fact that you have a banking license and your guarantees and everything mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. still, we're still in that transition phase, aren't we? Yeah, people people are inherently conservative with their money. And there is this, there is this inherent thing in people's minds of, um, there is a branch that I can walk into. You know, there is a physical yeah. building where I can walk into yeah. where my money is stored. Yeah. Now, it's yeah. not. It's not stored in that building. Yeah. That yeah. building just has access to the same computer systems you do. Maybe even, in fact, with a worse uh, interface than you are accessing. But, you know, this fact that there is a building that I can go into and harangue someone about my money that is the important thing for people and at the moment so i think what's going to eventually create this competition this transference to digital banks is not the coronavirus uh, because i still see huge queues of people waiting outside bank branches for some bonkers reason out in the streets um it's it's going to be gradually people are going to accept that accessing their money through their digital uh, offerings is going to be just as safe as accessing it in the bank and that will happen very gradually and this is where age does play a part because I think that the younger generations will more and more accept with like no it's online it's you know that it's just as safe as it being in a you know physical location you know this what, is and, and I think you're, what's the difference you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen post pandemic now, but I think one thing that that I I, I feel very much, you know, I've always I've, I've always been a fan of the hybrid solution where you can utilize um, a branch, maybe mm -hmm. for, for now for, for people uh, coming into to work and not going into a big office, but also um, to be able to network with other businesses and things like that. So I, I've always I've always felt that a little bit of the hybrid works, but but you know i don't know we'll see how that that plays out i'm i'm just i'm kind of mindful of the fact that we absolutely um want to uh also talk take the poll again and mm -hmm. i'm not forgetting that we need to talk a little bit about um, security uh okay. as well so let me just see in terms of questions um we have the engineering and regulatory requirements i think we've spoken about that and i think we are sharing everything later on so from a security point of view and maybe this goes back to the cloud uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, how is that working now? Because we hear all the time that the, there were breaches of, of data, you know, in their tens of thousands all over the place every day, and there's nothing that we can do to combat them. At the moment, we're seeing a lot of scams, financial scams around the mm -hmm. coronavirus. Yep. Um, and I, and I uh, just as an aside, I would urge everyone, if you can, to join us in July uh, for our digital programs on digital banking and then our follow on programs on cyber where we're going to go into this in deep, deep detail and do a couple of simulations. Um, but what do you think about that security? Security, yes. So I think that, um, so first of all, if anyone says to you, our system is completely secure, uh, impenetrable, um, leave them as quickly as you would leave the Titanic. <laughs> um, they are lying, uh, either they are lying or they have no idea what they're talking about. No Anyone cyber is, on the line? <laughs> no system is impenetrable. No system is without its security flaws. Um, no system is unhackable. Uh, the, the important question is not, is your system hackable or not? Is your system secure? It's how do you secure your system? How do you ensure you know, that you are constantly keeping up with evolving security and fraud threats? 
that's the important question. So right. at Starling Bank, we are constantly trying to attack our own systems. We are constantly oh. trying to, uh, you know, run penetration tests both ex internally and with external contractors. We have right. a bug bounty program where we basically go, uh, we we um, uh, put a, uh, a dummy version of the bank uh, online and we say to people who have signed up to our bug bounty program, if you can find a way to break into the bank, we will give you money. And they do. They come along and they find ways to break into the bank and we give them money. Um, and, you know, that basically means that they are finding security holes before criminals find them. Right. Um, and we are rewarding them for that. Um, right. So and it's fascinating watching these. I, you know, I've, I've encountered some of these uh, bug bounty hunters um, and they are fascinating people because some of them will concentrate on the most um, the, the most uh, specific things. They will attack the, you know, they won't bother trying to, you know, go, I'll try and hack into this this way. I'll try and hack into this this way. They will just have an automated setup which tries to hack in into a system in one specific way. And if they can't find a way to hack in that way, they'll move on to the next company's system uh, and so on, because they are very specialized in looking for one particular way of hacking into the system. They're fascinating. Um, so we've got all of these different uh, ways of protecting ourselves. Um, fraud, we are constantly having to monitor on uh, involving fraud threats. We are starting to try and deploy machine learning and AI to combat fraud threats because that is one of the uh, machine learning and AI gets a lot of hype and a lot of like, you know, use cases proposed which are just completely useless. But fraud is one of the, the places where I do think that machine learning and AI can come in and actually help. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to combat that in that way as well. Well, to come, you come back and, and, and uh, teach with us on the machine learning and AI uh, course that we have. I was fascinated. I sat in on the three-day course uh, last mm. year, and I don't come, as I said, from a tech background. It was really fascinating to see what is possible and how we're not really maximizing the, the, the oh, yeah. effect of, of, I, uh, of AI and machine learning yet. I mean, I would just be spending most of my time, I think, shouting, why are you doing this? Which is what I what I end up doing at a lot of machine learning and AI conferences, because a lot <laughs> of people are using machine learning and AI um, or they, they say we need to we need to use machine learning and AI. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's cool. It's you know, it's like the Internet. It's the new thing. Once we use it, everything will be fine. You know, <laughs> they, people don't really know why yeah. they use it. Apart from, you know, it's a new technology. You can join us further on, uh, and and we can discover why. I I would I, I say this because actually at at Imperial, what we're trying to do is have you know join up the dots that you're not learning anything in isolation, mm. both online and offline, and that you can communicate with everyone in the forum. And I, and I today, I mean I I I think we've. Uh, I know we've we've gone a little bit off the the plan of the slides, and I apologize if people were following along um, in se sequential order. But I think we have covered everything, um, bar saying that some of the incumbents are launching a response, as we see uh, with Metal, for example, at RBS, and they attempted it with with Bo, which was a pickup on student student banking from a business called Loot, and that failed miserably because mm. it was not it was not a genuine internal i want this to be a digital solution for a specific audience it was something that they acquired from an investment and i think if we go back to the beginning of today digital needs to be from the top down the bottom up and the sides in you need to be born digital for it to be effective mm -hmm. plug and playing onto a COBOL siloed stack somewhere is not the answer and if your ceo doesn't believe in digital then your customers are not going to buy into digital and i think now we have enough proof points over the last few years to, to say that this is so and if you all indulge me i'd like to take the second poll question which is the same question but we're going to we're going to see how you feel now Okay. Well, it's now starting to hover around, well, in fact, you know, around the 50, 55, 40, 40 mark, 45, 50. Well, we're coming into to being sort of neck and neck. Right? Yeah. I think we are almost split now in mm. terms of the, um, the poll. No, it's good. Right. 
But and and I I want to say that I I hope everyone will come and join us uh, in July. Um, the dates are July the 13th to the 23rd for digital banking, Jason. That includes you as well. I would love for you to come back and join us so we can go a bit deeper uh, over the the longer period of time. We'll be doing 90 minute sessions over a period of days. I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm thankful that everyone is joining us on this virtual journey. Yeah. With one minute left in our time together. I would like to thank everyone who joined us. I'd like to see you all again later on in the year. And Jason, thank you very, very much for going on this digital banking journey with us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Pleasure.